I can't tell you how thrilled I am to be here in Monterey for the first time, um, especially to have this wonderful opportunity to share with you where I live and uh, to let you know that salmon fishing isn't dying everywhere, but we are facing some potential risks. Um, so I live in Dillingham, Alaska. This is the picture right here. It's downtown Dillingham. It's rather spread out. It's a population of 2,400 people. We're the largest town in Bristol Bay. Now, Bristol Bay is about the size of Ohio State, about over two dozen communities and 31 tribes, mainly of Aleut and Yupik, all of which that we've been relying on our land and water since time immemorial. Without our land and clean waters, we are, uh, we're nothing. So I grew up around the subsistence way of life, to live off the land, but to live in harmony and respect the environment taught to only take what you need and never to waste because Hlumya may be watching. Now, Hlumya is a person or spirit of the universe that lives within Mother Nature. And we believe that the dead animals or plants were always among us living through their spirit. And so if you were to misuse or mistreat that animal, then their spirit would not allow their kind to come back to Earth and be born again or return to give itself up to your family the next harvest year. So from our perspective, this would explain why certain species have been placed on the endangered list or have gone extinct, similar to why people would kill walrus for their ivory. So now I fully understand why my mother would take the moose bones or caribou bones from my plate when I was a youngster and bulk the bone, really clean the rest off, the rest of the meat off the bone thus not wasting meat and showing respect to the animal that gave itself up to our family. Traditionally, when you harvest your first moose, you're supposed to give it all away. You're not supposed to keep one slice of meat or the, the rack. Um, and so when I harvested my moose this fall, which wasn't my first and won't be my last, I gave most of it all to my uncles and other relatives, uh, considering they didn't get a moose this fall. And I'm just one small guy and they have other mouths to feed. So sharing has always been a part of our culture, but also caring for the environment. When my uppa or grandfather would make medicinal birch bark tea, he would strategically take the bark from the leeward side of the tree, the side that got the least amount of wind, and replace that section with a patch of moss acting as a band-aid. And he would tell my mother, we must keep the tree alive. With the additional parts that we didn't utilize or eat, we found other uses for them to build equipment that enhanced our way of life. When we'd make our kayaks from seal skin and wood, we would make them so that they were proportionate to our own bodies so that you can maneuver efficiently with them. For instance, you couldn't do a Eskimo roll in a kayak that didn't fit properly. Now the Eskimo roll was a tactic used, a hunting tactic used on clear waters as they would flip over the kayak, look underneath the water, and look for game to catch. It was also a survival technique used if you're caught in a storm. So everything we use, we made so that they're proportionate to our body. And a lot of the equipment we use came from the environment, but ideas did as well. For example, the idea of a fish gill net came from the spider web, or the idea of snowshoes came from a snowshoe hare's tracks. So our people, well, people in general have utilized tools to increase their standard of living, and that's still in effect today. Right now, we no longer have to rely on sailboats to catch our fish or pull our nets up by hand as we got hydraulics and engines to do the bulk of the work. We have boats, small boats, ATVs, and snowmobiles that are a primary source of transportation in um, a lot of these villages. We just got cell phones in our region the last like five years or so. I was stunned when I went back for the summer after school and we had cell phones. We have internet, it's fairly slow, but I hear we're uh, gonna be getting 4G by the end of the summer. I'm excited for that because it'll only enhance our capabilities to uh, connect with the rest of the world. And so we're starting to see more advancements. One thing that we don't have that I used to crave when I was a kid, but now I take great pride in it that we don't is fast food restaurants. Much has changed within our region, but the value of nature has not. Considering you can only fly in and out of Bristol Bay, the cost of living is extremely high. I mean, when I left, we were paying 6.32 for a gallon of gas. 
and it gets even more expensive in the villages around my town. So that makes it extremely hard to travel to certain areas to harvest food or to heat your homes in the winter. A gallon of milk's around $9. A 32-ounce jug of Gatorade's $5. So because of our remote location, high cost of living and lack of jobs, our subsistence resources are crucial to our well-being. As a dear friend of mine, Dennis Andrew, would say, Bristol Bay provides the food for our dinner table. So if you look at the picture, these three bowls, colorful bowls, that's a gudok, also known as Eskimo ice cream. It's a mixture of berries, sugar, and now Crisco. Crisco is a new substitute for seal oil. But over to the left, there's herring eggs, varieties of fish, fried bread, moose balls. Not, not balls, but moose meat balls. Um, <laughs> So it's uh, very important that we continue to manage our resources uh, wisely. So the spirit of the salmon must be happy with us because recently, in the last 10 years, we have had record-sized sockeye returns in some of our rivers. And that's saying a lot because our commercial fishery has been operating since 1884, and it has had its ups and downs as salmon runs tend to fluctuate. After World War I, we had terrible runs linked to over fishing uh, due to the high prices and uh, high demand for canned salmon at the time. But since then, we've made drastic improvements for our management of our resources. Uh, in the 70s, we established a limited entry permit act that only allows a certain amount of permit holders or captains to fish our waters during a season. Also around the same time, trawlers no longer have access to certain parts of our Bristol Bay, and that was a huge step. But one crucial step is that we allocated fish escapement levels. So in other words, we cannot commercially fish until a certain amount of salmon make it up our rivers to spawn. And Fish and Game monitors the population of salmon by placing counting towers and sonar along certain migratory routes that our salmon travel. So now we are considered one of the best managed and valuable fisheries in the world. We actually had some visitors from Kamchatka this fall that came to our region to see how they can better regulate their salmon fisheries because they're experiencing problems, especially with salmon poaching. So our ecosystem thrives because of our clean water and lack of human-induced pollution. However, at the moment, there are several companies looking to exploit our lands and waters through mineral exploration. One issue is the proposed pebble mine. The pebble mine would be one of the largest gold and copper deposits in the world, but it would be the largest open pit mine on the continent, right at the headwaters of our spawning grounds of the two most prolific sockeye salmon runs on the planet. I mean, tens of millions of salmon go up the Nushigak and Quijak to Lake Iliamna. Even up to 60 million salmon go up there every year they would plan on building potentially one of the largest dams in the world to contain up to 10 billion tons of waste rock. And they would need to contain that forever. It stays toxic. The soil within that deposit contains a lot of sulfide concentration, which once sulfide mixes with oxygen and water, creates sulfuric acid, which is toxic to fish. Also, copper is known to be the dredge enemy of salmonoids. Just the little bit of parts per billion that gets in the water can affect the sense of smell and uh, won't be able to return home. That's a big issue because we're along the ring of fire. We have earthquakes. The earth's always shifting. I remember last summer I woke up. I was shaking. Chandelier was swaying. So it's not a matter of if there's an earthquake. It's a matter of when. So despite that... Um, our region, most of our residents live below the nation's poverty line. But despite that, 80% of our region oppose this pebble mine. But just because we oppose the mine doesn't mean it may not go through. The deposit lies on state lands, and we only account for a small portion of our population. And so therefore, it's important that we are spread the word. It's part of the reason why I came down here create more awareness, let people know what may be at risk, a renewable resource that thousands of families depend on. It's a multi-million dollar industry that is sustainable. 
um, 400 to 500 million dollars are made to the economy just through salmon alone. Salmon fishing isn't dying everywhere. As you can see, it's very full of life and it's important that we continue to manage it. But we are facing several threats. Another issue is offshore oil and gas development. This is the area where Shell Oil plans to drill and it would not only threaten Bristol Bay salmon, but Yukon and Kuskokwim salmon reside there as well. They're found there throughout all four seasons of the year. But also there's a halibut nursery ground that's closed for halibut fishing, just to help sustain the population of halibut throughout the state. We have several endangered marine mammals there, including the Pacific right whale. They plan to make $7.7 .7 billion out of 25 to 40 years, whereas the fisheries from the king crab, pollock, cod, salmon, contribute 4.1 to 5.4 billion a year to the economy. Here's some pictures of our migratory routes that our salmon take. We have some serious problems, including providing more economic opportunities for our region. Some people, some villages are experiencing outward migration towards urban cities. But a lot of us choose to live there for a reason. Because of the rich resources that we have, we may seem poor to the nation, but a lot of us feel really rich. I know when I travel with my uncle to the lake, he'll look at his land on the lake shore and he's like, yell out to the top of his lungs to the moon, we're millionaires. <laughs> so we have plenty of jobs in fishing in Dillingham, but there are problems. We need to increase local hire in our fish processing facilities. One thing that just started up in the village of Togiak, the community of Togiak owns half of this new fish processor that's joint venture with Copper River Seafoods now. And their whole incentive was uh, to increase local wages. And they provided $1.67 million into the local fishermen within their second year of operation. Also, a big issue is increasing salmon permit holders, watershed permit holders that live in Bristol Bay. The majority of permit holders are non-resident, so they'll come, catch all our fish, make a buttload of money, and then leave and not spend a dime in our economy. So that's one thing we're trying to increase right now. I'm actually looking forward to purchasing a permit in the near future. So whatever we do to address our economic problems, we have to include some of our cultural traditions, especially regarding the respect my ancestors had for our environment. Because our lakes, our oceans, our, our rivers, salmon, moose, all that has been the lifeblood of our existence. And it's important that we continue to pass down these traditions to our future generations, because they're the ones that are gonna inherit these problems. We gotta keep our cultural traditions alive. And I, I love this photo because they're not only splitting up salmon correctly, but they're even using old traditional knives, the ulok. I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you for listening to me. If you have any other questions, I'll be more than happy to, um, just pull me aside. <laughs>